Hello there everybody, Sam's Drains here, welcome back to the railway. It's a very, very good day today because I have a brand new steam locomotive to review for you. Today's steam locomotive then is a Dapple steam locomotive, brand new, only just been released. I got it in the post yesterday. It's also Dapple's largest steam locomotive in double O gauge that they've produced in many, many a year. So the loco is this. It is the Great Western Mogul, very similar to the Backman Great Western Mogul that they produced many years ago. If you want to see that review, check it out. However, unlike Backman's most recent releases, the price for this model is very, very reasonable indeed. The RRP is £159.95, and this is available brand new from Hattons for just £135.95. Now, bearing in mind, we've just seen Backman announce a much smaller tender engine for £220. This thing for 135 seems to be pretty decent. So, if you're interested in picking one of these up, I will include an affiliate link down in the description, although you might want to act fast, because if this locomotive turns out to be good, they could sell out very, very quickly, and of course the price is right as well. So I've not opened the box yet, I've no idea what this is going to be like. I will stop waffling now, and we will open this up and find out. Very exciting, let's do it. All right, so nice chunky packaging, really big box actually, same form factor as the diesel, which is good news, it's gonna be a substantial loco, I reckon, and it's heavy too. The box seems fairly, fairly hefty, so I'm really hoping we're gonna get a nice heavy model inside here, possibly even with a little bit of die cast, although at 135 pounds, my expectations for lots of die cast are fairly limited, but hey, let's be positive, I'm open to being surprised. Yeah, lovely line drawing of the class on the front of the box, it is very handsome, isn't it? I think I've always liked moguls. It's quite a nice wheel configuration. Let me show you the end of the box then. This is the version I went for. 260 mogul, 6336, green Great Western Era 3. Uh, oh, sorry, I missed the top part there. It's 4S-043-001. And it also says the minimum recommended radius, that's curves, is R2. Now, I don't have any curves that are tighter than R2, which means that this should be absolutely fine on my layout. I should also say that this version I've got here is not lined, but they do have some BR lined versions, which look absolutely stunning. So like I say, link below if you want to check those out. For now, though, there's not a great deal to see on the box, which means at last I can open this lid and see what we have inside. Here we go then. Man, I've been looking forward to this. I've had it pre-ordered for a long, long time. Long time. Right, so what have we got here then? This is the owner's manual. Let's have a quick look inside because usually this will give you a good idea of some of the features. Okay, so first things first then. There's a little history of the 43XX. So if you want to pause and read that, feel free to. There's some of the specifications. You can see there's quite a long list actually. There's quite a lot of features on this loco given, again, the, the fairly reasonable price. So we've got a bit of a quick start. Useful if you just want to get the damn thing running straight away. This here, over here, is quite interesting. It says, attaching the tender to the locomotive. The two are not connected in the box, it seems, although there is an electrical connection. I believe this is quite a revolutionary new feature, which allows the loco and tender to be very, very easily disconnected. I'm really hoping this works well and doesn't cause any derailments, and I hope that the electrical contact is good and reliable as well. Something that concerns me, but hopefully it will be absolutely fine. You've got this, I believe this is what is known as the toolless DCC fitting, so you can remove the smoke box door there, and I believe you fit the DCC decoder onto a drawer that you can just literally pull out of the smoke box. Yes, it's like on a sort of key, almost like a USB drive. Very, very clever stuff, this. It's very user-friendly, or so the instructions would lead you to believe. Anyway, there's all sorts of information inside here. Obviously, if you're new to the model, I would recommend uh, reading these. Look at this. This is some of the parts. Look at that. All nicely printed, by the way, in colour. Huge number of parts. Anyhow, yeah, I think that's a good look at that. But let's have a good look at the model, because that's what we're all here for. Let's pull off the foam then. Great packaging, it must be said. All right, there it is. Well, I say there it is. It's very much hidden, isn't it? So, for the first time ever, let me pull this out. And at long last, find out exactly what we're dealing with here. It's been a lot of questions from me about this. What the hell is this thing going to be like? The first Dapple tender engine even in many a year, at least in double O gauge, or probably in O gauge too, yeah. 
<laughs> anyway, right, so I can see we've got some accessory bags here, or an accessory bag. So what have we got? Well, first things first, look at this. It looks like we've got some etched number plates. I was not expecting that for a relatively inexpensive model, so that's really, really nice. You've also got vacuum pipe inside there. This big long thing, I believe, is a tool to assist you in removing the front of the smoke box in order to actually fit the DCC decoder. It really seems like they've thought of everything, doesn't it? They've really, really thought this through. And then finally, I'm not entirely sure what this is. I'm sure the instructions would explain. My guess it would be a speaker housing maybe for a sugar cube speaker. Not entirely sure, but either way, etch number plates, really impressed with that. Right, come on then, let's get this baby out and see what Dapol have been able to do with this. I believe the Loco and Tender are not connected by default, which means before I can try this, I've got to connect them. Anyway, are you ready? I'm gonna pull off the plastic. Ooh, look there. Right, two things I've noticed. First of all, the sort of satin sheen on the locomotive. It looks distinctly unplasticky, doesn't it? I'm sure it will be plastic. I'm not trying to say it's metal, don't raise your hopes. But it just looks quality, doesn't it? There's a quality look. Second thing, the detail in the coal load. Look at that, that is some super high resolution coal and it's moving as well, which means it's removable. Well, since they're not connected together by default, I can pull out the tender to begin with and show this to you. Wow, I was right about the finish. Look at that, that finish is absolutely stunning. I love it, satin, not gloss, not matte, somewhere in between, that looks marvelous. The wheels look really nice as well. Look at those, really high shine. And I can see that there are pickups. Uh, they, <laughs> they're a bit like that uh, AliExpress loco, actually. They seem to be touching the flange. No resistance, I suppose. But then you do have the concern over time is that are the, are the wheel flanges gonna wear the pickups away? I suppose that's a small concern, but yeah, tender pickups is a great little touch, I think. Right, that's great. Really love that tender. It's pretty heavy as well. Right, loco then, moment of truth. Here we go, let's pull this thing out. All right, oh, blimey, look at this. Right, well, it's heavy. It's got a good amount of weight to it. The running plate and sort of lower chassis, so that's the steps as well, is all die cast. 135 pounds and you've got that element of die cast on board. That is fantastic. The wheels look superb. I was, well, on some of the sample images, they didn't have the covered axles and they looked a little bit naff. On the final models, that's not the case. They look superb and the finish just looks excellent. It really does look good. Wow, I'm impressed. Well, I'm not gonna give too many of the details away because I'm gonna study this and I think I'm gonna really enjoy studying it as well. And then we'll come back in just a second and take a really close look at Loco and Tender. Let's bring the Tender in as well. Look at some of the details and then of course, I will get this down onto the track and give it its test. Come on, Dapol, it looks good. Let's hope it turns out good. Let's do it. Here's a little bit of history. So the 43XX was also known as the Great Western 4300 class, and it was introduced in 1911 to the design of George Jackson Churchward. In total, 342 were built over a 21-year period, which ended in 1932. The design was entirely made up of standard parts previously manufactured from different locomotives, including the standard number 4 boiler, with the superheating of course, Saint class cylinders, 31XX wheels, and the design was so similar to previous ones that no prototype was required. They knew it would perform as intended when they built them. And they were right, uh, hence the relatively large number of locomotives built of course. They performed some 50 years of service doing mixed traffic work, and they lasted well into the BR era where the final withdrawal took place uh, in 1964, I believe. Only two remain in preservation, which is a pity, although at least we have got those two, and of course the rest were very unfortunately scrapped. Folks, this is good. This is really, really good. I was not kidding when I said some serious thought has gone into the design of this model. In fact, I'm ever so slightly staggered by just how smart the design here is. In fact, I would say it's probably the most innovative thing I've ever seen on a model locomotive. It's absolutely wonderful. First things first then, how easy is it to couple loco and tender? Are we having to wrestle with an annoying plug? Are there screws to undo? No, watch this. That's it. That is it. And to uncouple, you do the opposite. You pull them apart and they uncouple. That is absolutely wonderful. And it's worth showing you the actual power connector because normally between loco and tender, you need four wires, four connections, two from the track and then two to the motor. But because all of the DCC circuitry and the motor and everything is all inside the locomotive, we only need two connections from the tender because all you're doing is adding the support from the tender wheels in order to help with picking up. 
or at least that's what I thought to start with, although looking at the instructions, there are four contacts on there because you also have the option of fitting a speaker into the tender. So the connector's super simple. You've got one connection on the top, one connection on the bottom. You've got a nice contact inside the socket. Bob's your uncle, it works absolutely perfectly. Now the reason why most manufacturers don't do this is because it's inconvenient to have to fit sound and decoders and things inside a locomotive where there isn't much space and where there's danger of damaging the mechanism and the motor and all the other headaches that you might encounter. The absolutely amazing thing here is that Dapol have thought of this and they've actually found a solution. So first things first, you use this tool. You use the wedge end of it to remove the smoke box door, which is a little bit fiddly it's quite a fragile piece, it's quite easy to damage. Eventually though, it is possible to get that smoke box door off. Then you use the other end of this tool, which has got like a little hook on the end of it, sort of, and you hook it around a drawer. And when you pull that drawer, you actually get the DCC socket out of the model. The socket itself actually comes out of the model so that you can fit your decoder, you can fit your speaker, etc., etc. And when you finish doing that, you put the drawer back into the smoke box press it into place, all of the contacts are sorted for you, and then you just pop the smoke box door back on. It is absolutely wonderful, and it works a treat. Well done, Dapol, that is wonderful. Okay, let's talk about the locomotive then, which is also equally wonderful. I've already said it has the die-cast running plate, and it is ruler straight. I haven't even got my ruler with me, but I did check, and it is perfectly straight, and it adds an awful lot of weight to the locomotive. And loco and tender come in at 308 grams, which is quite a lot, isn't it? It. that's not bad at all. Next up, the finish and the decoration is absolutely superb. As I say, mine doesn't have any of the lining. No doubt the versions with the lining will look even better. Even though you've got the etched nameplates in the detail bag, the Tampo printed ones look absolutely fine, as does really every other area of the model, as you can see. Particularly the buffer beams, that's quite nice, isn't it? You've got the running number on there, and look at the buffer beams, by the way. You've got all of that beautiful riveting detail, separately fitted vacuum pipes, and you've got the sprung metal buffers here. I should say also that the sort of resolution in the detail is so much higher than the old Backman version. Look at the top, for example. Can you see an ugly seam line there? Nope. That's because there isn't one. It really is that neat and tidy. And I also love the finish, as I've already said. The boiler itself has a real slight glossiness to it. So does the running plate. It shines. You can just imagine this rolling out of the workshop, can't you? Looking absolutely pristine. Really love that. Okay, underneath the boiler, you can see we do have daylight. It is very realistic in that sense. And underneath, you can see we do have a representation of the motion inside. That is really quite wonderful. Over on the other side, you've got the separately fitted reversing rod, which is unfortunately made of plastic. I do prefer the metal ones, but it's a relatively small complaint. Similarly, the whistles in front of the cab are just made of plastic. I suppose that is to be expected because they are very, very fine. They do look a little bit plasticky, but overall, I would say they are not unconvincing. Same again, the safety valve bonnet here is just made of plastic, but it's nicely moulded, as is the chimney. No copper top, as far as I can tell. It does feel like it's plastic. So if anything, that's a slight theme with the model. Quite a few plastic details, but quite honestly, that is the only complaint I've got, and you can't really call it a complaint. The only other minor thing would be the slightly unsightly join, presumably between the chassis and the body. Um, which is a little bit noticeable, but then again, it has been reasonably well hidden because it's so low down on the boiler. But if you're looking for it, you will spot it, which I know some people don't necessarily appreciate. So you've got beautifully separately fitted handrails, as you can see, separately fitted smoke box dart, which is very nice and fine. The running plate is complete with the lamp irons, as you can tell. The wheel set looks wonderful. Again, the finish on those wheels looks wonderful. There's absolutely no clumsiness in the manufacturing there. Look how nicely moulded those are. Really, really nice. One thing I have noticed is this sort of strange clouding effect on the wheels. I thought to start with that might be just a residue, like on the firebox, though I was able to rub the firebox clean. On the wheels here, it's not coming off, so I think that might be permanent. Maybe that's a slight lapse in the quality, but I think that's about the only thing I've been able to spot. And the running gear just shines beautifully as well. So, I mean, if you'd like your locomotives looking pristine, this is wonderful. Equally, it's a blank canvas if you like your weathering. There's a lot you could do to this to make it look a lot more realistic. Cylinder area, look at this. You've got this large metal piece on the back of the cylinder. That looks pretty realistic. So you've actually got like metal cylinders, it looks like. 
fitted into the cylinder housing, which is marvellous. And then you've got those little cylinder drain cocks underneath, which are pre-fitted. Oh, I know you want to see the cab. Go on then, let me show you the cab detail. Look there. Now, it's a very, very exposed cab, so the detail inside is very important on this model. And Dapple have not let us down. Look at the painting inside there. I believe you do have separately fitted parts. It looks like the regulator is separately fitted. All of the gauges have been picked out. The pipework has been carefully picked out as well. I absolutely love that cab, that is marvellous. You've also got the separately fitted tender four plate, which I believe does move, sort of. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit stiff, it's that, but it feels like it should move because as it is at the moment, it doesn't quite meet the tender, but I will I'll have to investigate that. And then of course, you've got the separately fitted glazing. Perhaps they're not quite as neat and tidy as they could be, but they are at least sort of flush with the outside of the body, which is good to see. The tender has also really impressed me as well, for similar reasons really that the Loco did. The finish is marvellous, the satin finish is fantastic, the decoration again, look at the great western lettering there, it looks marvellous. The amount of riveting on there is also quite astonishing isn't it, and they're such high resolution rivets, they're such tiny little things, but they're so perfectly formed, it's really just a joy to see. The underframe looks marvellous as well, there's just a, a slight metallic finish to it, that's sort of metallic sheen which you don't always get, and it just makes such a difference when the light catches it. Again, all of the brake rigging is pre-fitted, so you don't have to worry about that, and you've also got a separately fitted water scoop under there as well. The coal absolutely beggars belief. This is the best ready-to-run coal I've ever seen. In fact, I think they wasted their time making this removable because it looks that good. I really don't think you could do better if you fitted your own coal. You've got all of the separately fitted tender controls as well as the separately fitted handrails. Around the back, you've got more handrails, more lamp irons, and a very well detailed buffer beam with the pivoting NEM coupling on the back, which is very, very free to pivot, actually. I cannot see that causing derailments on curves, even with the lightest of wagons. Oxford Rail, I'm looking at you. It's very, very nicely detailed. Look even at the tiny little buffers between Loco and Tender. Even the minutest details such as those have been replicated, which I think is marvellous. So it's safe to say for £135, I am blown away by the features and the level of detail on this locomotive. It is really, really impressive. I cannot believe that Dapol did this. I really can't. It's so much better than I've seen from them in the past. It just beggars belief. Well done, Dapol. Well done. This is an absolute credit to them. But what's the mechanism like and how does it run? Well, let's find out. So there she is then, the beautiful Dapol Mogul in double O gauge down onto the track, looking absolutely fantastic ready for the first ever test. Now the mechanism generally is really, really good. First up though, I wasn't able to remove the body to show you the motor, I apologize for that. I removed the body retaining screws and gave the chassis a little tug, it was not shifting. Now I admit I could have tried a little bit harder to remove it, but I was really scared of damaging the thing, so no motor to show you unfortunately. The instructions did show that it has a nice flywheel fitted to it, although I'm still not sure whether it's a three or a five pole motor. If I had to guess it would be a five pole, but I'm not entirely sure. I was able to remove the base keeper plate to reveal the fantastic set of proper brass bearings. Look at those, that's really, really good quality. And then the center axle is also sprung as well. Now I'm not entirely sold on the benefits of that. However, if this gets around my track without any problems, I won't say another word against it. It's also got almost all wheel pickup. It really is just the front um, pony, or pilot rather, uh, that doesn't pick up. All of the tender wheels on all of the loco driving wheels pick up, which is absolutely fantastic. I also did a quick test of the gauge of the driving wheels. Now there are a little bit on the tight side where the back to back's concerned. The first two sets of wheels, the first two sets of driving wheels measured in at 14.6 millimeters, they should be 14.4, and the back set, the driven set, measured in at 14.5, so very, very slightly out of gauge. However, the front to back gauge was only 0.06 millimeters too tight, which I'm fairly sure will be negligible. So whether that slight tightness on the back to back will actually have a practical effect remains to be seen. That being said, overall, the mechanism does seem to be entirely sound. But, how does it perform? This is the part I'm worried about because this is the part that has been a letdown in the past. So, I'm gonna set this forwards and with no small amount of trepidation, I'm gonna turn up the controller and see if this thing works. I'm doing it now. Oh, it's inching forwards, a bit more. Ah, oh, there it goes. Now this has not yet been running. The instructions say that no special running in is required, but I'm gonna do it. 
but straight out of the box, that wasn't a bad crawl. It seems a bit inconsistent, but maybe that will get better. Let's go a bit faster. 50% speed, I tell you what. That looks good. That does look good. That is nice and smooth. It's working. That's the main thing. I believe this also has the firebox flicker effect, although that is not working at the moment. No. So that's at 50% speed on DC and there is no light output there at all, which means that the LEDs must have quite a high threshold voltage. I've now sped it up to 60%. Still can't see any light. 70%, which is at this point faster than you'd ever want to run it on DC. Still no light. 80% I now see a bit of glowing. It's very dull because the LEDs aren't lined up with the actual firebox, which means it is quite a subtle glow, unlike the Terrier. 90%. Yeah, it's no brighter, is it? So yeah, unfortunately that's not a feature you're really going to be able to make use of on DC, which is a pity because the Terrier actually works really well on DC, or at least my replacement one does. <laughs> However, that is pretty slow. It's not dreadfully smooth, and I think it's stalled there maybe, get, a bit, get more power. That's really good. I mean, that's as good as the old Backman, if not very slightly better. Wow. Yeah, that's not bad. I'm hope, I mean, I will be really impressed if it's better after it's run in, that's for sure. But as it is, that is slightly above average, maybe. Maybe average. Forwards, that's good. It's just a little bit inconsistent in its speed, which suggests that something might not be 100% perfectly balanced, but certainly at anything above a crawl, that speed, for example, it gets much more smooth very quickly. Mm, that's not dreadfully smooth either, is it? No, I'm actually not touching the controller now. Okay, very good. Right, right. Well, the bit that I'm really worried about is will it actually handle my layout okay? <laughs> so let's try this. Let's set it to 50% speed and see. All right, come on. Hey, it didn't slow down on that curve. That's the first good sign. Let's see how it gets on with the, the dreaded curve up here. I don't really know why it's so dreaded, but... Ah, yes. It's working faultlessly. I honestly can't believe it. Constant speed, no slowdown on the curves. It's working as it should. Wow, awesome. Oh, I'm so pleased. Well done, Dapol. I knew it was going to be a good one. Right, well, let's get it running, and I'll feed back on the performance shortly for you. Okay, there we have it, folks. Running in has concluded, and it well, it went fine, no issues whatsoever. It never once derailed, it never once cut out. I'm really quite impressed with this. One thing I have noticed though, is that still on one or two curves, it does seem to noticeably slow down. Now that could well be to do with the slight gauging issue that I've already described. Yes, the gauging is a little bit tight, but more likely I think it is yet again to do with the gearing. Now the reason I say that is that there is quite clearly a lack of torque. If I set this forwards and just put my thumb in front here and set it up to 50% speed, you see that? It is struggling, isn't it? And then I let it go and it goes much, much faster. Now the Backman Mogul doesn't quite do that. If I do the same thing with the Backman, you can see that the wheels are able to turn much more quickly. Not only that, but there's quite a lot of headroom on the higher end of the speed spectrum. If I turn it up to 80, you can see the thing really does fly along. So there's definitely room for this to be geared down a little bit to favor those slower speeds. Is it just the gearing? Uh, I think that's fairly unlikely. I would say the motor might be slightly to blame as well. And don't forget the situation was very similar with the Dapol Terrier in double O gauge as well. That certainly seemed to have some pulling power issues. This could also explain why the slow speed performance wasn't absolutely amazing too, although we will try that again now that it's been run in. Pulling power though, I measured 0.23 newtons on the drawbar, which should be enough for around 16 coaches. That's quite interesting because the Backman Mogul was slightly more, that one managed uh, 17 coaches I think, despite the Backman version being a slightly lighter model. So again, that points to torque issues, doesn't it? Anyway, how is the slow speed now? Has it improved now that we've run this thing in for a good while? Let's see, forwards. Okay, so that kicked in at a quite high speed. Let me do backwards and see if I can start a bit slower. I'm turning up real gently this time. There we are. 
It started and then it stopped. Keep going. So, I mean, it's slow. I think slow gets a tick, but it's not smooth, is it? That is quite juddery. So I think it's a combination of motor and gearing. It's not a huge issue by any means, and I don't think it points to a fault with the model. It just leads to slightly undesirable running characteristics, doesn't it? But not a deal breaker, I would say. In fact, that's slightly better, isn't it? Yeah, that's actually not too bad, but it's not what I would call a top crawler. Let's keep watching. Let's see if we can get at least a full rotation in, and then you'll know whether it, there's any sort of tight spots in the rotation. And that is struggling a bit more now, isn't it? It's almost stopping there, but it is actually managing to persevere. Yeah, so there was, there was definitely a tight spot there, but whereas it was stopping before, oh, Oh, forget that. Oh no, it kind of got away with it. But you can see what I mean. I think we've seen better, haven't we? So do bear that in mind. That being said, I do want to know what the pulling power is like in practice. How does it actually handle coaches around the layout? Is it going to slow down massively on curves with a load? So I've been perhaps a little bit nasty in giving it six coaches. They are, mind you, modern coaches with modern wheels, so the drag should be relatively small. Let's test the coupling. Let's see if it's at the right height. Hopefully Dapo got that one right and let's see how it handles the coaches. Set it into reverse then, and off we go. Right, let's see. Yeah, it's not terribly smooth at you know even the moderately low speeds. I'm not touching the controller now, for instance. And as you can see, there's definitely a tight spot in the rotation there. So yes, I'm not sure quite what's doing that, but anyway, let's see if we can get a, a reasonably controlled coupling, yes. So the coupling hooks are indeed at the right height, that's excellent. There we go. Well, it's handling them, and it seemed to accelerate them fairly quickly, so that's that's not bad, quite impressed with that. So on the inside line, or sorry, the middle line, I have one of the Backman Moguls, which has, by the way, now been rendered obsolete by the Dapol version. At least where the cosmetics are concerned, it's not a complete walkover, I suppose, because the the performance is actually comparable, despite this having a much, much poorer mechanism. But uh, yeah, overall, the Dapol version obviously knocks the socks off Backman's. And so it should, because Backman's is clearly quite a lot older. And then on the inside line, I have the early Great Western Green Line version, something I hope to see from Dapol. I mean, look at this. Yeah, the lining makes it, the copper makes it. If Dapol could do a nice copper bonnet like that, it would look absolutely amazing. Anyway, off it goes. There we go. Let's catch up with the Dapol version then, see how it handles the track with some coaches. All right. So the slowdowns were negligible around that curve. Now that it's on Gordon's Hill, that slight torque issue has come into play because the mechanism's clearly slowed down quite noticeably. But not as bad as some. It's obviously nowhere near as bad as that Backman Hall class I had, which was almost grinding to a halt at the at 50% speed. Or was it 40? I'll try it at 42. But yeah, overall, that is better than expected, isn't it? So it's handling a, a reasonable load, not at all badly. So in practical terms, it seems they're not great crawlers. But besides that, I would say everything else is 100% fit for purpose. Quite impressive. Okay, this is now at 40% speed. I am expecting to see a difference this time. Yep. Yeah. Oh dear. Right. So yes, I don't think I'm in any doubt now as to what I said about the torque issues. And the fact that it is not speeding up now that it's off the curve suggests that it's probably nothing to do with the gauge. Although I'm not saying that that's not a factor. But, yeah, I, I don't expect it's due to the gauge. And I think it's almost come to a stop there. Yeah, not a powerhouse, is it? Not a powerhouse. And, uh, like I say, the Hornby Hall class does not do this, as I've previously demonstrated. So it's a pity about that, but, like I say, if you speed it up a little bit, and presumably if you were to use this on a feedback controller, you wouldn't see the same issue. And in fact, I don't really like seeing it struggle like this, so I'm going to speed it back up to 50. There goes the back one up the incline slightly there. No such slowdowns with those, it must be said. We're seeing that quite a bit, aren't we, at the moment? 
But no, I mean this Dapple, it's a beautiful runner, look at that. That is so nice and smooth. But it just has to be going reasonably quick before it gets that smooth, I suppose that's the only issue. But frankly, I'm just absolutely thrilled that it gets around my track without derailing. That is so good, I was so worried about it. But no, look. It's very sure-footed. Thank goodness gracious for that. So here are some of my ratings then for the phenomenal, really, Dapol Great Western Mogul. Far, far better than I expected. I'm really pleasantly surprised. So the level of detail, maybe I've been slightly generous, but I have seen fit to give this five star. I mean, the beautiful quality finish is something that really caught my eye. It's not in the least bit plasticky looking. It's got all of the top quality details, such as the sprung buffers, the firebox glow, tons of separately fitted parts. You've got the valve gear between the frames, the tender, and particularly the coal load in the tender is just so impressive. All of the little details you could possibly ask for are in there. The cab is marvellous. Overall, I think the level of detail deserves a five star. If I was being super picky, I thought about maybe dropping half a star for the lack of metalwork in certain details, but I've decided I'm going to take that off the quality instead. Overall, the level of detail is really, really good. The performance is a very slight disappointment, but overall it's satisfactory, I would say. So, I've given it three stars. I mean, it's a lovely runner. It's very, very smooth. It handles the coaches very nicely. However, it does seem a little bit underpowered, as I have demonstrated, and the slow speed performance isn't exactly amazing. So had the gearing been slightly different to favour the lower end of the speed spectrum rather than the higher, and possibly if they'd fitted better motors with even higher torque, the performance might have been better. That being said, the performance is better than the Terrier was. It doesn't slow down quite as dramatically as that did. The pulling power then is okay. Uh, 16 coaches, uh, 0.23 newtons. That's a little bit weaker than Backman's, bearing in mind that Backman's was a little bit lighter too. So again, yeah, a little bit better torque in the mechanism might have done wonders for the pulling power. The mechanism though, I have gone ahead and given five star because I really do like what they've done with this. Uh, you've got all the proper bearings. The sprung center axle seems to do the job. I mean, it doesn't ever cut out on any points or anything and that's made even better by the tender pickups of course very very good on the pickup front you've got a nice flywheel fitted to the motor and the motor I mean despite not having the best of torque in my opinion it does seem to offer a nice smooth performance which is really really good overall I can't really fault the mechanism and it gets like special mentions really for the, that beautiful loco to tender connection that is marvelous and also for the absolutely revolutionary method of fitting DCC to this model never seen anything like it and it's really really effective love it very very good okay so the quality generally speaking i was going to give this a five star i've just knocked off half a star for the lack of metal details such as reversing rods and copper chimney top that kind of thing i think they look a little bit better although obviously the copper wouldn't be suitable for this livery but it would have been nice to have the chimney made of metal as that's a detail present on some locos which is a nice improvement in my opinion uh, however generally the quality is really good the die cast running plate is fantastic the assembly is just phenomenal no glue marks everything fitted properly nothing missing no warping of the running plate or anything ridiculous like that all of the joins are reasonably well hidden yeah, it's just really, really good quality. Top quality, well done Dapol. Value for money, now I have to say, I paid £135.96 for this, and it's worth every penny. Yes, it's quite a lot of money, it's far from cheap, but you get what you pay for. It's a decent runner, it looks superb, it's been built to a high standard, it's had a lot of thought put into the design, and given all that, I think a modest price tag is more than acceptable, and we should encourage it. I'm not one of those people that just rejects models because they're too expensive. If you get a bit of what you pay for, I'm all for it, and I think this model delivers exactly that. So very, very good value for money. I honestly would want to buy another one. In fact, I think I probably will. Overall then, that is 8.75 out of 10, a very, very good score. Let's put that into the logbook. Oh yes, just in the top 10, there it is, just above the J15 from Hornby and below the Fowler 4P. If the performance had been a little bit better, it would have been top five, no doubt about it. Mmm, I love it. I can highly, highly recommend this one, folks. To be honest, I'm not seeing anything that would stop me recommending this. <laughs> it's really, really nice, isn't it? Performance isn't perfect, absolutely not. But, overall, for what it costs, it's stunning. And, hmm, something caused it to slow down more than it did last time there looks like we've got some 
extra weight on board or something. Hmm. So overall then, it's a very, very innovative model, beautifully put together, really cleverly designed, and overall it is fit for purpose. So there we go, let me know what you think down in the comments. Was I too generous? Was I too harsh? Let me know, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. But for now, I think that will just about wrap up this review. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. It's a thoroughly welcome addition to my collection. Absolutely love it. I'm really, really tempted to buy one of the lined green versions because I'd love a pair of them, but maybe that's a bit excessive. I'm not sure. I'm not an excessive person, so hmm, a bit out of character perhaps. But yeah, overall, pleasantly surprised. Affiliate links in the description if you want to pick one up. And if you too have picked one up, let me know. How did you get on with it? Does yours run like mine? I'd be interested to know that as well. But for now, thanks for your company, folks. Thanks for your time, and I'll see you on the next one. All right, cheers, everybody.